This podcast is a proud member of the Unidentified Network. Police in Las Vegas found themselves in the middle of a UFO mystery last month after an... Big eyes, they have big eyes. Uh, we got some water or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? Or? One of my partners said they saw something fall out of the statue, so that's why I'm kind of curious. What's going on? Do you see a male, sir? Yeah, I'm going to call it Uh-oh. Okay, hang on. Is he in your yard, sir? Yeah, I caught him. He's big. Okay, what's he doing in your yard? Mythical Legends Podcast with your host Daniel Barnett. Hey guys, and we're back for another podcast. Ha- ha- happy Sunday, guys, and um, we have a brilliant, and I mean brilliant, podcast lined up for you guys. And um, I'm, I hope you really, really enjoy it. So we're going to bring our co-host on. Um, she is very, very now well-known in the, um, let's say, mythical legends and the Bigfoot community in the UK, I would say. Let's bring her on. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Yes, very good. Thank you, my love. How are you? Very, very well, yeah. Um, so, um, we have a brilliant, and I mean brilliant, podcast lined up, don't we? We do, I know. It's just so many of just amazing people. And yeah, we're... and 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 so we, we learn so much, don't we? <laughs> every time, every time we just add to our knowledge, I know. it's mm. And today is going to be no exception, I know. Yeah, yeah, and say so we tend to go so off track, don't we? We can never bring ourselves back, and we can never, never bring ourselves back to our original question list. Or, um, and it seems like, yeah, so, um, um, yeah, I'm really, really excited about kind of, um, t- today's podcast, aren't you? Yes, yeah, 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 let's do it. good, right? Let's, um, let's bring him on. Um, you guys may know who who this person is um and we are very very excited to have him on and he friend um i friend requested him about a month ago and um and i managed to get around to messaging him um and we're now here doing a podcast i proudly present steve coles hey what's up daniel (laughs) i'm very very well mate how are you i am marvelous good mate good so honored to be here so honored to be here, and hello to my friends over the pond. Oh, I'm sure you've got loads of them over here, very much interested in what you've got to say. Yep. Sure do, sure do. <laughs> Amazing. So, Steve, let let's jump straight in, and I'm and I'm not going to mess about till let's get straight in and go with um, what got you interested into the cryptozoology world. Well, when I was. Uh... Very young, uh, my father exposed me to a, a program called Legend of Boggy Creek. And in that movie, there was it starts off with this little boy running through the field. You hear these roars and stuff like that. And he was about my age. So it kind of like, and I remember saying the Legend of Boggy Creek, a true story. And that fascinated me. This Something like that would be true. And... As I get older, I kind of lost interest. When I got into my, my mid-teens and late teens, when I got about your age, I started forgetting about it. And uh, I started thinking about cars and, and girls and, you know, <laughs> what every other teenager thinks about, too. And, and uh, so I became a professional investigator and I became a trained forensic interviewer. Um. Out out of school and and, and began a probably 10 years into my investigative career, I came across a book suggested by a friend called Monsters of the Northwoods. And I looked at it and I'm going, this is all about Bigfoot in my own backyard. Hour, hour and a half to the north, hour, hour and a half to the south of me where I lived. 
<clears throat> in New York State. And I'm going, wow, I didn't realize that, you know, they were up there or they were up here, I should say. And um, so I said, but, you know, I bet you this is a bunch of baloney. And the more I dig into this, the more I'm going to find out this is all made up. Then I started interviewing some of the people that were involved in that. And as a terrain forensic interviewer, I'm going, these people are telling me the truth. Or at least they believe they've seen what they've yeah. seen. Yeah. So that's what started my journey on this. And uh, it took uh, 98 through about 2011. So you're talking yeah. 13 years before I had my first real sighting, you know, with my own wow. naked eyes. And then a year following, I had another sighting, and that's been pretty much it. Oh, wow. As far as sightings. Wow. But, yeah, it was quite the journey, and, I, you know, always continuing to uh, do it. But what I try to do is bring my skill set as an investigator, as an interviewer, as, you know, to uh, kind of get in, get the facts out of somebody, see if they're telling the truth, mm-hmm. uh, go from there. Yeah, why? Wow, and say, I think, I think, Jill, that answers our question for um, later, later down the interview. I think that, I think that (laughs) answers our question. Um, so before we we get into hear more about it though, don't we? We want yeah, yeah, yeah. and say, um, so before we get into the sightings, Steve, I want to go to kind of your more opinions. So. Do you believe Bigfoot is a flesh and blood animal or do you believe it's supernatural? Um, I believe it's a flesh and blood creature. Uh, It leaves footprints on the ground. It has Mm -hmm. articulate hands and feet, large brain, small snout, looks like a primate. Yeah. A a lot of its behavior, um, behavioral patterns mimic what primates do. Um, and I think there is some good scientific possibilities of why people would have a supernatural event or something where things go astray. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I yeah. and and just to it let is, you know, we we are completely on the yeah, yeah, for, for flesh and blood side. We feel, but but we understand that a lot of people that we've talked to. Um, sure. think quite the other way you know and, and they've got valid mm. points and valid reasons but um i mean we're we're quite practical when it comes to things aren't we sure. kind of investigations and mm. trying to yeah. sort things um i think i was quite interested in your bias steve that you said you're very keen on sorting out fact from fiction and and how right. you go through it and in a very very much more low key that's what daniel and i try to do we we analyze everything we see we question and mm-hmm. question each other trying to get yeah could this be a natural sure. thing? how could it be if it isn't what could it be um we try mm. uh, you know we try to keep our feet on the ground kind of thing. yeah we do As a, a, and i think with sure. kind of the 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 researchers kind of brain let's say do you, do you think, Steve, it's easy? It, it's kind of good to have kind of that skeptical kind of side on your kind of brain as well, and not have all kind of the because uh, because otherwise, in my mind, it, it'll, you'll out you'll be out in like a broken down tree. You'll go that that's Bigfoot, and I think to have that, yeah. What do you yeah, think? I I think um, there there there's something called cognitive dis- dissonance out there. Um, and, and in that, a lot of people will, uh, you got to have, number one, I treat every single case as a case-by-case basis, just like yeah. you would treat a crime. Yeah. We all know, we all know, uh, let's say, let's take a look at, uh, for example, robbery. We all know robbery exists, right? Yeah. Mm. Right. But somebody comes up to you or... Let's let's even switch this up. Let's let's make it a little more controversial. We all know that that uh, people get hurt on the job. So we all know that people have workman's compensation claims all the yeah. time, right? But there are a few that are kind of faking it, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what you have to do is you have to go into each investigation. We know there's Bigfoot out there, but we have to go in there to either prove or disprove it. And regardless of what we believe, we need to go in there unbiased uh, and, and and base our uh, our in, uh, our well our inv- course of our investigation on what's being presented to us. Yeah. I can meet somebody that's the most sanest person in the world and yet find no evidence in, in the field that they have that occurrence. I can meet the craziest person in the world that's making up all these elaborate stories and find one single footprint. But is that footprint real? So there's so many different rolling yeah. elements. Yeah. You have to go in yeah. each, each single case unbiased and evaluate it separately. And just because something isn't, if this is not a Bigfoot, if this is a hoax and misidentification, mm. that doesn't mean anything to the overall goal of does Bigfoot exist to me. No. Yeah, mm. it's just one investigation in many and many to come. Yeah. 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 So that, that yeah. Yeah. That, I think that's a brilliant, brilliant way to pull it. And, and, and say, do you, what do you think is the, key steve to proving this creature's existence do you think the key will be perseverance finding methodology methods that work Mm. and hitting uh, the the same area as many times as possible and as much as possible and either trying to habituate it and what I mean is not like a habituator, like we have habituators in the field, uh, but like Jane Goodall habituated chimpanzees. Make yeah. them familiar to your presence. Make them not afraid of you. That is common in every single animal on the planet, including us. So, um, you know, that's one way. But what kind of evidence it's going to take, unfortunately... I think it's going to take either a body part or a body, unfortunately, before science will say, whoa. That's the sad thing, isn't it? Right. You're all going to need, um, you don't want anything to to hurt anything, but if you could find some physical evidence without compromising them at all, you get that. Well, there there are certain ways. um, If you were to set up a technology trap, uh, viewed on a DNA collection point so you can actually see what you got the DNA from and mm. you and you keep number one you have to keep your uh, you have to keep the scene forensically clean you have to collect the DNA with with you know with perfection mm. you have to keep the chain of custody of that evidence you know uh, and that mm. includes, you know, if you have a video and audio and, and, and you know, pay pictures of this collection area and it's so you have to document, you know, when you set it up, what you set it up, how long it's been there, the time, the time it was collected, the, you know, and then the film is a whole nother piece of the puzzle. And that all has to be done very professionally, very yeah. neat. Yeah. And then perhaps hopefully, uh, you know, they would get the DNA, but now you have the evidence to show what left the DNA. Right. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem with a lot of, um, mm. you know, mm. p- p- but the and, way to, and, but the way to quickly end it is like, here's a Bigfoot arm. Yeah, that would end. That would yeah. end. That would end it pretty quickly. Now, my hope would be mm. to uh, hopefully we could come across one that's already deceased. Exactly. So rather than of one, couldn't it? Yeah. And, and people ask, it. and people ask that question uh, all the time. Uh, do you think they bury their dead? Yeah, and, and my answer to that would be no, yeah. because yeah, as Homo sapiens, we started, and actually as Homo erectus, we started burying our dead to preserve bodies and to prevent them from predation. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is that when we started developing countries, uh, when this country started to get developed, we started digging. We were finding those bones of Homo erectus. We were finding those bones of. Aboriginal native, uh, Aboriginal Native Americans. We were finding all these things. We were finding mastodons. We were fi- that you know that had died many years ago. We were finding, um, and and the mastodons actually fell in um, this uh, tar area, this tar pit, prehistoric times when 
<clears throat> but we didn't find many, um, many, uh, many bones of, of animals of that era necessarily. But we were finding, you know, Native Americans and buried dead. And the reason why is because they buried the dead, preserve the bones. If something dies outside. You know, it, there you go. Everything is going to break. You know, the, the they have a body farm in Tennessee, and they put a deer out there, and within 14 days, uh, you could tell not tell that deceased deer had even been there because it got mm-hmm. predated on by insects, scavengers, bones yeah. were even eaten. And there's yeah. ton, in North America, there are a ton of animals that will, uh, you know, eat bone. Possums, mm. raccoons. Which is a, it's kind of the natural yeah. way, isn't it? It's nature's yep. way of clearing up. Right. I mean, we're the ones that, that, that right. bent the rules, haven't we? Right. Left to nature, mm. everything sorts itself out. So, so, so one would think that with, with all the development, developed areas in North America, that they would have come across a Bigfoot burial site, which they have not. So it's very clear yeah. that yeah. that they have not buried their dead, and it, uh, the argument that they do is kind of. To me, not number one, it's really not that important. But number two, it, it's pretty much been disproven to me, at least in my mind. If not, we would have yeah. come across yeah. like mm. bones by now. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. So, to kind of um, slightly move on from this <laughs> is, um, so where um, number one, do you go out researching? And if you do, what techniques do you use, mate? Well, I was just out, actually, I was just out a couple of days ago uh, investigating a, uh, a case. And what I use is a number of, of tools when I when I go. First, uh, I have a process. So, okay, this guy has made a written report or this girl has made a written report. So then I talk to him on the phone. I get some more feedback. And then I go and meet them and I get more feedback. And all of these should remain pretty consistent. Um. And as a trained interviewer, I know that sometimes people can be off with time, distance measurement, uh, because that over time may even change a little bit. Like, yeah, mm. I was 120 feet. And then I was thinking more about it. It's really about 150 feet. Or maybe it was yeah. about, you know, 20 minutes, not 25 minutes. Or maybe, you know, so all those are uh, the, the time spatial relationships. Conversely, people can say, well, you know, I thought that Bigfoot was nine foot tall or 10 foot tall. Really, when you get a few more than two and a half, three feet above your own height, height becomes very difficult I'm to tell. Lost. Yes, mm. yes. Yeah. yeah. Think about how, I always say, think about when you were a little kid, how tall your grandfather looked. Wow, he was <laughs> a big man, right? And yeah. then you end, And then you end up growing up realizing that he's only, what, five foot seven? <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So you lose that. You lose that perspective when you see something that tall. Uh, but what I what I not only do I, I bring to bear as skills, I, then we have to develop based on the terrain, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, strategy we would we would want to deploy. Do we want to put, you know, trail cameras up? Do we want to go in there? Do we we definitely want to sit and hang out for a while? Listen, Um you know, have some thermals yeah, available and go from there. Mm-hmm. And that's really the, now I do use a primate behavior model. Um, and this is something that uh, I started doing back in the uh, early 2010s. It was about, um, about 2010. I start, actually it was 2010 when I first started to work up this working theory that, that we, classify Bigfoot sightings a lot of times like UFOs, right? Mm. We have the class A sighting. Well, that was a sighting. We have a class B, which is usually a vocal or some other type of, and then we have class C, the tracks. It's kind of like a way we classify UFOs, you know, first uh, close encounter, a first kind of scene and close encounter, a second kind of physical evidence. It's very, <clears throat> but instead I look at it from a behavioral aspect because primates, uh, you know, basically live in four areas, but th- three of those four areas are really important to us. And I'll, I'll explain the fourth in a minute. But first of all, th- think about how we all live. Okay. We all have a home range. Those are the areas where we go from day to day on a daily basis. And, <clears throat> and this is the, the addition to that is the core area. 
the core area is where we travel the most. Like most of the days we go out the door, we hang a left, go down, walk down the block or drive down the block. Uh, but you know, every once in a while we'll take a right, but that left would be the core area. That right would be the regular part of the home range. And then we have foci areas, which are areas where we do things. And that could be schools. They could be theaters. They could be shops. They can be, uh, um, uh, parks. Um, and then we have the final one. We have our territory and our territory is our homes, our flats, our, 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 you know, where we live. And based on those particular areas, how we interact with other beings as primates ourselves, even, um, is varies on where you are. You're walking down the street, you see another person. You may say hello to them, you may not, but you just keep on going, go on by. You see a strange dog, you, you're not going to go. But let's say you go into a mall. You're having pretty much a lot of the same behaviors in the mall. But now you go to a school. And if somebody enters that school that doesn't belong there, it's going to be a little bit of a different reaction, right? Yeah. Right? Wow. Right. So it depends on what the activity is on the foci areas. Oh, right. Wow. And, then, yeah. and then finally, you have your territories. Now, if somebody strange walks into your house, you're going to get the bat. Right. Get out. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So think about that in relation to all primates. Why does why does a Bigfoot a lot of times your person's hiking in the woods and all of a sudden they're like, oh, and the Bigfoot looks startled as well. And it turns around and walks away. Home range, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, sometimes somebody will stumble upon a Bigfoot you know, and they're like bent over yeah. eating something and they'll look at him and they'll just go and off they tootle. It's kind mm. of, and then there are the other times when somebody says they got very aggressive. They stood there and they bluffed charge. They stood there and they, they threw something at me or, or, you know, or they screamed. Um, and they got escorted out of the area, like they would start to leave and, and the thing would follow them. Those territorial behaviors. Yeah. So based wow. on so based on those type of models, that's what I base the importance. So sometimes you may not completely have a visual sighting. Hey, I was in the in fact, my research area one <clears throat> was uh, I became my area uh, one because of a married couple hiking going off trail and they got off trail about a quarter of a mile when something started to scream at them and the guy was a very avid hiker in that area and wow. he said it was so loud he could feel it vibrating in his chest mm -hmm. so he says uh he says to his wife we better get out of here so they start going out of trail and the thing is still screaming at them but it's following them a bit off to the side he's looking and he can see wow. off to the side this shadow very tall shadow Going from tree to tree as they're as they're leaving, and eventually, oh my god, out. that's an escort. So to wow. me, that's a very territorial. Yeah. Uh, probably the yeah. most aggressive a Sasquatch will get towards somebody, towards another primate. Mm -hmm. Because one other thing that I found very interesting, with exceptions of um, some very small niche category culturally of primates, primates of one species really do not attack openly primates of other species. And if you think about that, that's why we have this guttural reaction when we see a poached gorilla on TV. And for the most part, most people would not like to have, oh, let's have a nice monkey leg this morning. Like, um, right? It's our guttural reaction. That's instinct. Now, there are some cultures due to, to food demand and stuff like that, that, yeah, they because of the food supply and what's available, Yes, they would eat monkeys. Chimps will attack, and certain groups of chimps will attack monkeys because that's the food supply that they need or they can have. It's the mm. most available to them. So there are cultural differences. So Wow. That is really interesting. And I yeah. reckon I now I I reckon we'll have to take every piece of advice there because <laughs> that that that's awesome, really. Yep. Yeah. 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 So I, I basically follow what the behavior is. Okay, if it's a walk off, I'll go out there real quick, look for evidence to, at the walk off. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time there because 
it's a one-off. It's a home range thing. It's a one-off. The roadside crossing, there's a home range, right? Mm -hmm. um, you start getting that a little bit more, and then maybe you'll get it. You might find a choke point that people keep seeing them. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have your foci areas, which is kind of like flip a coin because you don't know if it's. But then you have something which is a territorial thing. And now you have a way to get close to that territory. Use the natural curiosity of a primate, for example. If something goes boom outside, the dog's going to run out of this room. The cats are going to scatter. We're going to be like, what was that? Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's yeah. our primate. That's uh, our natural primate curiosity. So the whole idea mm -hmm. is get to close to their areas without really being an invasive and going into their areas and really disturbing them and going, hey, look, us, look at us over here or look at that over there. And then mm. from there, we can get them to come out to visit us rather than us impeding on them. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Wow. That, that, that's, that's really interesting. That oh, wow. really is there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, kind of, lead, well, a bit leading on to that. When Daniel and I go out, being here in the UK, we're down in the southwest. Um, and although we've got loads of forests and, and open lands, it's very small, very, very tiny compared to the US. We tend to focus, we, we've been to a few different forests, don't travel too far, um, but there's one small forest that we go to where every single time we go we have found odd things interesting things things that we keep drawing us back so from your experience we, we're never quite sure when we go out should we go further afield should we travel different places or is it more beneficial to go to this local small one and keep searching because we've never been there without finding something that we've gone can't explain it. What is it? <laughs> <clears throat> well, it it depends what you're finding. I mean, and and, and that's that's question number one. Um, and, and number two yeah. was, it's always good to explore elsewhere, right? Yeah. Like myself, yeah. I have my area one. That doesn't mean that I I prohibit myself from going here or there or elsewhere to investigate. I still will go to my area one. Yeah. So, okay. you know, you have to you have to go where the iron is hot. And if somebody mm -hmm. is seeing something somewhere, that's where I recently that's where I would be. Yeah. 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 OK. Well, and, and so just to give you a very, very quick background, um, I'm I'm not sure if you know anything about me, Steve. Um, now, I myself and um nan we have found an 18 inch footprint and inside that footprint is old world monkey and great ape dna really go <laughs> <laughs> so that was when how we started i mean we right. started with such a bang it was mm. like this can't right. be true this can't be happening <laughs> <laughs> So what? What I would? What kind of DNA was in it? It was e old DNA. world monkeys. Yeah, e DNA, environmental e DNA. DNA. It, it. Well, you know what makes that really interesting. Um, is it was a small percent. I mean, there was there was human mm. dogs, squirrels, badgers, all the rest, mm. and then a small percent of old there, world. Um, there was and actually, um, and I'm gonna correct you on that there um right. there, there there was several hits in and not in just one place we found no. one no. um quite striking print and then several indentations probably about 15 minutes away so we took soil samples from each of them and they and it all came together as a one well, working print. what makes that interesting is that in a lot of of um, of the the spectrum of Bigfoot sightings, they a lot of them are at nighttime, and a lot of them see what they what appears to be eye shine, like they have a tapetum lucidum. 
which is the mechanism yeah. in a deer or dog or cat's eyes that reflect that light and makes them see much better at night. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is there are about 10 species of primates that have a tapetum lucidum. The great apes don't have them, oh. but the old world wow. monkeys do. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wow. So that's what makes that interesting, finding wow. that that kind of the yeah. old little monkey DNA in there going, yeah. well, that's funny because... It, it, it just doesn't relate to anything in the UK, you see. Mm. That's, that's what's right. baffled. We, right. we sort of obviously asked lots of people about it, and they all come no, up no, with... Or, no organ grinders or anything with the little uh, chip with the cup, though. And so, and so even, even, even kind of... Um, Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum said, this changes my whole perspective of what I think of Bigfoot. Yeah. And I go, so no one knows. No yeah. one knows what, well, what you, this is. Just, you noticed I wasn't too surprised. I found it interesting, but I wasn't yeah. that surprised. I was like... Yeah. yeah. I go, <clears throat> wow. and, say, and say, yeah, so there's, um, there, there's a few more things that I will kind of cover with you after this podcast. Right. And, um, and, and the amazing thing, the amazing thing about that is like, like, you know, and I would say that actually in a lot of private circles, I like, go, oh, it wouldn't be surprised if there was some old world monkey DNA in this, in this thing because of its nocturnal ability. It was like some yeah. kind of evolutionary shift. Yeah. I'm sure it's a great ape, but I'm sure some of the, you know, the DNA is going to be kind of a, uh, a I'm, I'm more believing that, they have some relation to the Gigantopithecus because mm -hmm. they do a lot of aspects look orangish a bit, right? Yes. Mm. But yeah. I, I believe they're their own stem because yeah. of the uh, yeah. vast differences. They walk upright like we do. They yeah. kind of have hair, longish, kind of like an orang a lot of times, and reddish brown a lot of times like an orang. Mm. Yeah. And they have a tapetum lucidum, which makes them a little old world monkeyish, and even new world monkeyish a bit, because they're already, they're, they're kind of split between the two. Like there, there's um, uh, tarsiers and uh, you know bush babies and and stuff. Those are just a couple of the of the the old world, but um, you know it doesn't have a prehensile tail, so it doesn't climb. And uh, which always got me with people is that, well, you know, Bigfoot, you know, look up in the trees, they climb a lot. I mean, I really don't have a prehensile tail. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's a nat or natural uh, adaptation to climbing is to have that prehensile tail for, for balance and navigation. Mm. So, <clears throat> but it doesn't surprise me at all. Wow. Mm. I'd say that there's, there's kind of lots of other things that I will tell you kind of throughout kind of after, after the podcast and kind of on onwards, Steve, where there's loads of stuff that Certainly. that we that we could tell you. Um so we're gonna take a quick break guys and we're and we're gonna ha um have a look at this advert and then we'll be back after the break with a complete new topic. Okay guys For half an hour on Saturday afternoons and for quarter of an hour on Wednesday evenings, the world's only show about hard science, weird shit and so reality. And it's co-presented by an anthropomorphic chicken. Be there or be square. <laughs> There we are, we're back. <laughs> After all this Brilliant. time, I still do not understand that advert. <laughs> no, that, that I was say it's, um, so, um, it's let's, um, I, I'm going to a completely new topic now, Steve, and I'm going to go on to kind of a question which isn't brought up much, um, but I, w I wanted to get your opinion on this. Huh. Is, what's your opinion on the USA government? covering up this mystery um hang on <laughs> <laughs> so um 
my opinion of them as a cover up is this is it like the UAP cover up UFO cover up no it's more of a not a cover up but rather a refuse to acknowledge mm. deny 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 we see this with other animals and other groups of government officials saying, oh, there's no catamounts or cougars in this area or mountain lions in this particular state or that state, despite, here's a trail cam picture of one. Yeah. Look at the length of that tail. Look how big it is compared to the fire hydrant in the background. That is not <laughs> a kitty. Right? Mm. Um, so I don't think it's anything concerned, anything um, organized. I think that, you know, certain fringe elements will say, oh, there's a government conspiracy. Well, what evidence you have? Well, uh, there, there was this time when, you know, we found Bigfoot tracks and, uh, you know, so we, and we, we were going to plaster and we came back a little while later and we noticed a ranger driving out and all the tracks were covered up. That's a conspiracy, really? Mm-hmm. You know, the ranger yeah. probably came across and saw them as like, Oh God, I better hide these. Otherwise, there's gonna be about 65 nuts in this yeah. park within an hour with guns. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. And that's why there is that denial, is because they don't want that. A lot of times they don't want the bad publicity. It has mm-hmm. nothing to do with <clears throat> trying to. I, I think 99 percent of it is we're doing that because we don't want to be overrun by people that you know, want to, you know, form a ring around a Bigfoot holding hands and sing Kumbaya or people that want to come in and, and, you know, sit there and get the, uh, you know, the uh, M150 <laughs> and try to knock out, you know, half the forest while, uh, with, yeah. the, with the Sasquatch. Yeah. So you have that. <clears throat> I don't think there's any active cover up. There was every once in a while you'll see somebody say, well, I was at Mount St. Helens, when Mount St. Helens erupted, and I helped fly those bodies out there, but people kind of seem disappear, and nobody can seem to give me a straight name. But yet I have a National Guardsman on the show who was in the National Guard in Washington at the time of Mount St. Helens, and he was like, what? He goes, we we, we weren't worried about any Bigfoot. We, we had we had a, the place looked like it had been nuked. Because we had yeah. thousands of people missing. We had Ooh. cars buried and we needed to get out there and try to see if anybody was alive. And there was people that were standing on the roofs of their cars and we had to pull them out. We weren't thinking about no Bigfoot. Yeah. We were in a national emergency. Mm. Likewise, there was uh, the propagation of a body recovery and a doctor, suppose a doctor doing and this is what made it even more thing. I think it was mentioned in that document that there was an autopsy done. And, and, and in fact, when you do a, that type of procedure on an animal or an unknown, it's called a necropsy, uh, necropsy. So that was flaw number one. But I managed to track down the actual people that was pictured in this, this uh, woman's article. And they they had nothing to do with picking up any dead Bigfoot body. And, and the supposed doctor was never a doctor really at all. He was just a forester. So that document's all been done. It was called the Miller Doc. And it had a lot of stupid. It, it had, it, as Dr. Melder said, it seemed to have a lot of scientific word salad in it. It, it, made, no, it made really no sense. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I've been see I've been over to the UK before, so I'm trying to keep my uh, my euphemisms to a minimum because <laughs> <laughs> I never realized how much Americans talk in euphemisms until you get over there and go and get, like the strangest look like. Right, so you're like, yeah, I got to avoid. That's why, yeah. like, yeah, that's like even telling you earlier about the train train of thought, I'm like. Uh, Hope they get that. <laughs> we'll catch up with you. <laughs> um. So, Nan, um, uh, that came up perfect timing. You have a question about the UK, don't you? 
Uh, well, we, yes, yeah, I was sort of going to do that earlier. Um, so we have quite a lot of opposition here about UK Bigfoot. Don't be ridiculous. Cannot possibly be. We're far too small. Mm. And then you get other people saying, well, it could be. It might be. It's worth investigating. Just like to get like people like yourselves. What are your thoughts on it? What are your thoughts of the possibility of a UK... <laughs> Well, cryptid of any of, yeah, of that kind of. Do you, do you want the funny first answer? Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on, man. I don't know. You live there, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair and, enough. <laughs> and, and, and in truth, and in truth, I I don't know a lot about Bigfoot in the no. UK. No. Um, I I know. A little bit about big the Yowie, um, Australia. Australia. Yeah. I know. I know a little bit about the Orang Pendek. I know more about the Canadian, the Sasquatch in Canada because, yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's in my it, that's in my neighborhood. I actually live 148 miles, 50 miles from the Canadian border. Wow. Um, so, in, in, in of itself. I don't know much about I. Yeah. I couldn't tell you with any expertise or any even have a really strong opinion. No, uh, okay. because I'm unfamiliar with with maybe the continental drift and the. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I do believe yeah. that at one time, and this is what makes it very possible, as at one time we had the ice age so that probably made the English Channel a little bit frozen over. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At one time, at one time, England was smushed up against, I would say, fr France and, and Europe, you know yeah. Europe. Yep. So that makes it possible that something could, you know, as it broke off, you know, mm. everybody's on the island with you. Yeah. Um, so uh, really difficult to it, really it is, pinpoint yeah. that with them. But yeah. if you're finding evidence and you're having sightings, regardless of it exists there or not. It requires somebody to go out and investigate it and not just laugh it off. No. And I think this is what's driven Daniel a lot is is and he's blossomed in that negativity of other people. It's mm. only made him more determined to go right. and not to find it or not to prove it. It's just to go and investigate. Right. That's the whole So I'm I, I'm going to jump in there because this is really odd and kind of I've just had a message from um, our team science science investigator, let's say, um, the because um, I, I have co-founded a kind of a UK Bigfoot re research team. About, and um, Nan, you'll find this amazing as well, about half hour from where we are, and this forest where the DNA is found, footprints found, um, is 15 minutes away. There has been a recovery, and let's say, of five 18-inch footprints and hair samples found half hour away from our forest. Wow. Now what? that's weird. <laughs> as we're speaking about it. Now that that is very exciting. Mm. Um, but I always put the caveat: in, that's exciting, but but yeah, you got to yeah. do the homework. Yeah. You, uh, yeah, I don't know if somebody is taking plaster cast. If at the very least, if you can take your smartphone and have a three D scanning app on there, you at least get it scanned mm. in. Mm. Um. <laughs> So that would be huge to do. Get a lot of pictures of the prints, measurements of the trackway. Mm. And when you look at tracks, you look at three measurements. You look at heel toe, yeah. heel width, and toe okay. splay. Yeah. Okay. Now you're, re yeah. you're ready for the pop quiz. Yeah. Daniel, I'm going to pop quiz you right now. Okay. Right? Should all of those be the same in each track in a trackway? No. 
which one should be different? It's okay, you get it wrong. The toe way? Bingo, you got it. Should be the toe splay. <laughs> because as a a nate as a barefoot goes into different substrate, there's rocks and stuff that will either push yeah. those toes apart. Yeah. Right. So the best way to find somebody just stamping them out is measure the toe splays real quick on all of them. And if they're all the same, there's a problem. They should mm. be different, if you know, quarter of an inch here, you know, an eighth of an inch here. There should be a difference in the measurements, which would indicate mm. a movable, flexible toe, yeah. toe, toe mm. splay. Yeah. And it's the most common. So that's what I would do right away to rule out whether or not somebody's, you know, messing wow. with you. Or we're not get those toe splays. Hair samples, well, um, great. Forensically collect them. They go into a paper envelope, not pa plastic. They go in. They don't, you know, or or a tube. Um, you know, uh, one of the other things too is I would take a couple of those hairs out of the envelope and start buckle swabbing them, and then putting those in the tube. See if you can get some DNA. Uh, the other thing is if you have a multiples of tracks. Take your take your uh, a buckle swab or two. You know, this is the upper half of the foot, and swab the track out. One of the tracks you're not going to cast. Swab that out into the tube. Swab the bottom half of the foot because the oils, mm -hmm. the oils in the feet will get onto the ground. If so, mm -hmm. you know, and DNA to... DNA technology has gotten that good that they swab a fingerprint or two now, and they can get DNA off a fingerprint. So. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. see, learn learning every podcast. Jill, yeah. Honestly, yeah. I learn. Can I ask a very quick question, yeah. Lucy? Yeah, what, go on. What's the importance of um, putting hair samples in paper rather than plastic bags? Because we've been putting it in little plastic. Of course, is, because is plastic retains humidity. Yeah, yeah. And what that does is it degrades any type of DNA evidence that's in it. Okay. If you watch, if you actually watch crime scenes, a lot of times they have evidence bags, they have little brown paper sacks that say evidence. Mm -hmm. And I know I, I I remember that. Yep, in the UK they call them sacks, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So they'll have these brown paper sacks with the evidence tag on them, and and that's important to have some of those too because when you put something in a container, you want to sign across the seal. You want to time and date and put your initials or name on it. Yeah. That way mm -hmm. it's called chain of custody and start a log. Hey, here's our evidence yeah. log. We have hair number it. Hair number uh, item number one is a hair follicle or a, a grouping of hair found at, you know, such and such uh, mm -hmm. collected by time date. Next yeah. one. Boom, mm -hmm. boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And that we way, it all. yeah. When you mm -hmm. send it to, and the person to send these samples to is actually, and be very interesting, is a, uh, a scientist over here in the U.S. who has a DNA project. His name is Darby Orcutt. And they're starting. Uh, right. him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you've had correspondence with him, you know, anything yeah. collected, you know, make sure it's done the right way. And, and um, the nice thing is Darby is the ultimate resource who will, who will get you that information, how to collect it, oh, how to send it, yeah. how to do all that. Uh, um, yeah. So. Amazing, yeah, <laughs> and say so, yeah, it's it, yeah. it's really interesting, uh, and say so, um, yeah, it, it's just beyond incredible. Nope. Um, so and 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 I can't believe we we've been talking so much. Um, fifty minutes have gone by, yeah, <laughs> almost an hour. So I'm <laughs> I'm going to um. Ask the last few questions, Steve, sure. and then I, I think, I think at some point we're gonna have to get you on again because we, as I said, we have we I've hardly been through stuff that I have on here. <laughs> um, so um, kind of, I I I've seen that you've been to kind of um several Bigfoot conferences. Sure. Could you tell us um a little bit about that? That's right, because over there you probably don't have. 
a lot of Bigfoot conferences. Well, the only one I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, depending on the venue, like I, I've gone to, a, I go to a couple of real big ones. Last year, I was at the Logan, Ohio. Uh, it's called the the um, Hocking Hills Bigfoot um, Conference. Mm -hmm. You notice my mind had to switch gears there for a second. You know, as I get older, you know, it seems like the clutch sticks a little now. So, uh, <laughs> oh, tell know, me uh, about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the Hocking Hills one is probably one of the biggest ones. It's in Logan, Ohio, and they the, the town actually cordons off like five city blocks for this thing. <laughs> wow! And uh, last year when I was there, we had forty-one thousand people show up over the course of. <gasps> Two days. Oh, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> Forty-one thousand. Yeah, it was nonstop. I even saw a bigfooter. I, I actually saw a bigfoot on a Harley Davidson. Um, I mean the things you see. Um, and you know what? I, uh, no complaint. I love where I sat, but they put the fried dough guy right across from my table. So all day long. Oh, all that smell of wafting sweetness and cinnamon greatness, cinnamon <laughs> greatness is coming over. I'm like, why am I hungry? <laughs> oh, I know. Right. So, <clears throat> but conferences, uh, I, I've, I, my first real conference I spoke at was in, uh, and I did do some minor speaking, but the first major one I did was the uh, MUFON UFO Bigfoot weekend they had in Westmoreland, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and uh, my it was 2011, and I remember, oh, my very first gig. All right, uh, where am I speaking? Oh, you're going on right after Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Oh. <laughs> but I killed it. I, I did kill it because that was the first time I talked about primate behavior in that. That was my first one. So it captivated everybody, which is really cool. Um, so, uh, uh, but not only is you get to talk to other researchers and kind of, you know, there's a lot of sidebars, a lot of socialization, but a lot of the kind the conversations, people are like, Oh, they're a waste of time. No, the, the conversation among Bigfoot researchers is what do you guess it's about Bigfoot. So it's not yeah. really a waste of time. You're networking, you're learning, you're, you're get, getting ideas from different folks. And at the same time, the general public comes in and you're educating them. And that's mm -hmm. one of my tenants of Bigfoot is responsibility to educate. So that's cool. And then you get the gems where people said, oh, you know, I've had a Bigfoot sighting and blah, 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 blah. And that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very, say, say, very, very um, cool. Can you, can you fill this card out with your name and address and tell me a little bit about, you know, the time and date of your encounter with a number. I will email you or I will, I uh, will. Uh, so now you're getting leads. Yeah. I mean, the last mm -hmm. Bigfoot conference I was at was the and my season ended with the Whitehall, New York Sasquatch Calling Festival. I got a dozen leads, a dozen of them. And then I have about four or five good folks that want to be on, on, on the, the expedition team. So we'll, right. we'll vet them out. So it's stuff like that, that that's really crucial. It's a great network. It's fun, too. I mean, look, you can see behind me some of the trinkets that I – that, yeah. that you managed to to pick up yeah. uh, over the years. And that was something I never was. I was never a collector. The only thing I ever collected were books. But okay. after a while, it was like, wow, I've amassed quite a collection here of stuff <laughs> that I never meant to collect in the first place. But people will, you know, people sent me you know, my birthday. Oh, here's this. My, you know, so the, and then you get mundane things like, oh, I have a beer. It's called Yeti. All right. Well, I'm going to. <laughs> Wash the bottle out, put the cap, screw the cap back on it, put it on the shelf. It's kind of cool to yeah. have. <laughs> yeah. So. Amazing. Wow. But, but conferences are a lot of fun. Uh, God bless the organizers because it's uh, mayhem organizing any event. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we're fighting yeah. that. Yep. <laughs> you know, yeah, and you know, say we're. The only thing that really would boggle my mind is oh. how ca how chaotic a Pokemon card training expo can be. But uh, anyway, 
<laughs> um yeah say so we're um yeah i think i think they're amazing to kind of um communicate and and kind of um yeah m- meet new people um and say um i i don't know how close you are to florida i will be at florida this year um would love w- would love to meet you um yeah about what time of year uh, so I'm there for the actual Great Florida Bigfoot Conference as a guest. So I uh, June isn't it? June eighth. June eighth is yeah. Thanks. Oh, I, you know, and the funny thing is, is that very day is a uh, day I'm at a show up here in Rochester, New York. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so, I. But um. Yeah. But. Uh, but you know what I can do is there is, and I don't know if you've talked to a Matt Larson out there. I know Matt Larson out there. I know Matt. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hopefully you'll get out and say hello to him. He's in the field, I think this weekend doing stuff. So oh, is he? wow. Yeah. Uh, on, on his corridor, uh, you know, his corridor expeditions. So, and I know he's got a lot of people and he's inviting in to do this corridor expedition. So I think he's putting up cams this weekend. So, mm. Yeah. So, wow. uh, yeah. But you know what? Uh, that tells me you have a passport, and that doesn't preclude you from, you know, getting out to, you know, the states again. Mm, say, and- um, the, to Florida. Um, me, I'm 14, and I've been. Man, how many times have been? 15, it's 15 to 17 yeah. times in between there. <laughs> Holiday, wow, fine. You're going so, um, yeah, so it's um, so yeah. what, what you want to do sometime is say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to take a holiday, go to New York, yeah, and then yeah. it's just, yeah, it's just I, I, a two hour, two and a half hours up the road, yeah, and you got me to take you out into the Adirondacks and into the, re- in the oh, research areas, and, mate, yeah, and I, I would be all your time. Year, that was our first <laughs> and I were there for five days. So I wish I'd known someone that was there. We were yeah. wandering around like well now, now you do. Now now you do. And if you go any if you go anywhere in the US, chances are I probably could put you in touch with a decent researcher to uh Wow. So well wow. mate that that's incredible, and I, I've really enjoyed this interview. So, my final question to you, mate, is: um, is where can people find your work? Well, people can find my work at squatchdetective.com or at squatchdetective.tv or squatchdtv.com, uh, youtube.com forward slash at squatchdtv, all one word. And uh, yeah, there you can find my books. You can find a lot of my articles, my videos on on some some analysis. I'm a bit of a uh, 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 I'm a bit of a tough on evidence. Let me just leave it at that. <laughs> have to watch wow, my ver- have to watch my vernacular and make sure that because I'm the one here with the accent, and I know that. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so you can find me any anywhere uh, over there. You can find anything that I offer up on any one of those uh, URLs. It'll lead you to the other to the other, mm. and you'll you can get me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, even unfortunately TikTok. Um, <laughs> and and um, I've done some funny stuff too. <laughs> it's kind of it's, it's <laughs> actually kind of you know you you get to meet Professor McGillicuddy if you look hard enough over on TikTok, and uh uh yeah Amazing. professor yeah professor mcgillicuddy is quite the character because uh you know he got into the big discussion is the world worth is the world round or flat oh and, okay <laughs> and uh his his resolution to that problem was was quite unique i'll, I'll say that that's why wow. i had to that's why i had to let him go but <laughs> yeah, I, I may I may rehire him sometime again, but I, for now I've I've let him. I've given I put him on permanent holiday, and uh, you know maybe he's getting the medication he needs. But um, that's but, hilarious. Um, 
Yes, but Steve, I can speak for both myself and Jill. We've really enjoyed this interview. It's been amazing. Um, and um it yeah, so well, thank I guess you so, so much. As you guys would say, it's been a lovely time and cheers for having me. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, yeah. Um yes, but um so to everyone out there watching this interview um on on pre-recorded thank you so much for watching if you guys have any questions for steve at all um i'm sure he won't mind if you message him or or you can go through me and i will get those questions to him um but yes guys so until until next sunday keep searching and stay mythical thank you so much guys Thank you for listening to the Mythical Legends podcast. For more information, check out our Facebook group. The truth is out there.